Um, all right, so we're talking about buyer consults. So JD touched on buyer consults a little bit yesterday. Um, I know y'all were there. Alex, did you listen in on that um, from so remotely? Yeah, did anybody on the out remote cyberspace listen to JD's class yesterday? Yes, I did. Okay. Cool. Um, so he touched on it a little bit and the importance of a buyer consult so that you can set expectations, you can ask all your questions, you can really learn who it is you're working with, what they're expecting from you, and also not waste a whole bunch of time showing them 5,000 properties when really they're looking for one specific thing. So today we're going to talk about what a buyer consultation looks like and some things, some of those questions that you can ask them to um, get that information you need to help them and save your own sanity and time. Um, so I've definitely been on the receiving end of buyers that want to look at every possible thing, even if it doesn't have anything to do with what they want to look at, just to see, because maybe the pictures are bad, or maybe the eight, maybe it really does have a fence, but the agent didn't put that it has a fence or something like that. So they just want to see it, just to see it. So we want to try to avoid that happening because your time is very valuable, time is money. If you spend two days with one person, that could be a day that you could have been spending with a second buyer or something like that. So um, when you get a buyer, meaning from phone duty, from a referral, from your sphere of influence, a walk-in, a Facebook lead, it doesn't matter where it comes from, you want to try to treat them all similarly they're all going to be a little bit different but you want to try to treat them all similarly and we like systems so if you have a system in place for your buyer consultation then you'll do it kind of the same way every time and you'll get really good at it and it'll kind of streamline everything so one of the systems that i use in my bar consultation is a folder and you can get these from Melissa. What are they, Melissa? Like a dollar a piece or something yes. like that? Yeah, we just charge the cost on them. Yeah. So we put our team sticker on it, but otherwise it just has the KW on it. And you can get them in white or red. We have red for buyers and white ones for sellers. So within the folder, we have different materials that we've put together over time. Testimonials, a little letter about the team, what we do offer. Um, something about Keller Mortgage, that kind of thing. So our buyer folder um, caters to buyers and what they would need, and then our listing folder caters to sellers and what they would need. So this is one of the systems we use to kind of streamline everything and make everything look similar. So all of our buyers get one of these. Another system we use is the actual buyer consultation. So I will be the first to admit, we don't bring everybody into the office for a physical buyer consultation. Sometimes you kind of do it on the fly at the first house you're looking at because sometimes those buyers just need to be treated a little bit differently. You're still gonna do the buyer consultation, but it may just not be in the conference room. Um, something JD touched on yesterday is safety. If you've never met these people in the office before, take somebody with you on a showing. Even if you're a guy, it doesn't matter. Take somebody with you. Um, it, it doesn't have to be something physical that they do for you. They can make an accusation that you did something to them. And if there's no witnesses, anything could happen. So just safety numbers, always take somebody with you, especially if it's not somebody that you've met before um, or shown property to before or something like that. Um, me having the team, it's really easy for us to say, hey, I'm gonna bring one of my partners with me just in case you know, I am not available, then you've already met them and you can kind of tag team it or whatever. Um, if you don't have a team or a partner that you work with, just find somebody in the office that you can rely on um, to kind of help you with that. Then if you're out of town or something, you can call them and say, hey, remember those people we met at that one showing, they wanna look at one and I happen to be out of town. And then your buyers have already met them too. So it's another kind of good way to have backup. Okay, so in a buyer consultation, you're gonna wanna go through the whole buying process with them. It can be pretty extensive. Um, you're gonna wanna know a lot about an hour for the, for the whole consultation. Part of that's gonna be looking at houses on the MLS. But you wanna go through the whole buying process. And in our 
command designs, there is a buyer consultation uh, kind of printout that you can use. You can um, design it to your own stuff. Um, like put your name, you can bring it to yourself and all that in designs. Uh, we also have a, um, a buyer checklist or something. It might actually be in here. Let me show you what the name of it is. Um, buyer responsibilities where the buyer knows up front, like you need to keep your credit clean. Don't go buy anything. You need to provide information to the lender as soon as they ask for it. Just things that the buyer can do to help everything go smoothly. So the whole purpose is you're setting the expectations. Um, you want them to have a chance to ask all of their questions, but if it's a first time buyer, they're not gonna know what questions to ask. So you wanna go ahead and kind of answer their questions for them before they even come up. Um, and it'll save you time in the long run. Something else I'll do or provide to them is a copy of the purchase agreement, because like JD said yesterday, it's a, it can take a long time to go through the whole purchase agreement with them, and it is important for them to know everything that they're signing. So you can send them home with a copy of it and say, read through this, we'll go over it next time, or call me if you have questions or whatever, but you don't want them signing it to be the first time they've seen it. Um, and if it is, sometimes it just works out that way. If it is, you need to make time to go through it with them before they actually sign it because it is a contract. Um, you need to go over the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, things that could go wrong because of various reasons. Um, the first thing they're going to come across is the home inspection. So once they're under contract, they're going to do the home inspection. A lot of stuff could go wrong from that. Um, they could lose the contract because of the home inspection. Maybe the house is, needs way more work than they thought and the sellers aren't willing to fix it. Well, now they're out their costs for their home inspection. So they need to be prepared mentally to lose their earnest money or and or their home inspection and appraisal money because those are things that they pay for up front. So let them know what those fees are and that there's a possibility they could lose those sometime along the way, depending on the circumstance. Um, let me jump, jump in if y'all have questions or anything. Y'all online too, just jump in if you have questions or if I'm going too fast. So what if you come across a house that you kind of already know is not going to be appraised for its value based on these things that you can notice? Would you even recommend them putting, like, would you allow them to keep going through with putting in an offer if you know it's not going to appraise for what it's worth? So, it? yeah, I mean, it depends. A lot of that's circumstantial. So if it's the perfect house for them, <clears> if mm -hmm. they're okay with doing some updates, um, but the floor plan is great. The location is great. The size is great. It's got the pool they want. If all the stars align and it's a perfect house, but you're just worried it won't appraise out, mm. then pull some comps for the house and submit those comps to the listing agent with, with the offer. Because you can say, hey, I realize this may seem a little low to your sellers, but I can't justify your list price. Okay. So this is where we're coming from. And Sometimes I'll even go a step further and say, if you have comps different from this that can justify it, maybe I missed, please send them to me. Because if we can justify the price, they may be more willing to pay the price and just kind of make it a back and forth between you and the listing agent. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't ever want them to overpay for a property and you can tell them, and I have before, you'll be protected by the appraisal. If the appraisal does not come back, for value or higher, then you can walk away from the contract, we can negotiate it down, but at the same time, you'll be out the money for the appraisal and the home inspection at that point, because those have already been done, you don't get that money back. So you could potentially lose $1,000 just because of where you're at when the contract falls apart. So pull comps, if you can't justify the price, I definitely wouldn't recommend the pay full price. Um, submit comps with your offer. So we'll see. Um, this is, that's where it is really beneficial for them to work with you as opposed to going straight to the listing agent. The listing agent's not going to do that homework because they're working for their seller mm -hmm. and they want to get the most for their seller. So if somebody, if you have somebody come along, it's like, hey, you know, I'm just calling the signs, no big deal. I'm not really working with anybody in particular. That's something you can use to kind of get them to work with you is, hey, I'm going to represent you and advocate for you and take care of you. Those listing agents are working for their seller. They're not going to work for you. They can't legally work for two people at one time. So um, 
yeah, that, that's a good value proposition is that, that you can do that homework and really fight for that price. But normally you would get the earnest money back, right? So the earnest money has to be signed off on on a release by both parties. They can be released from the contract without getting their earnest money back. And if the seller does not agree with their reasoning or is just being mean about it and doesn't want to release the earnest money and sign off on that release, then it just sits in the company's escrow account. No, neither party gets it at that point until, until somebody agrees to do something. Um, the company can opt to interplead it into the court system and then let the courts decide who gets it. Mm -hmm. Typically, depending on the reason, they're going to side with the buyer, mm -hmm. um, but not always. I've had one seller that was like, you know, it, I know I won't win it in court, but it's the principle of it. Like we were a week from closing and they walk away. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not really fair. Now we have to go put it back on the market. But so. typically if it's, you know, if they're walking away because of the home inspection or the appraisal, and they still have to sign off on it. They still have to sign off on it. Is that where you put the contingencies in the buyer's agreement? Yes. So the contingencies are built into the purchase agreement. So you've got the home inspection, the termite, the appraisal, if the property does or doesn't have access to internet, um, a survey contingency. There's all kinds of contingencies in that purchase agreement. Take the purchase agreement costs if you haven't. That. But that's what I'm saying. I mean, I would have the contingency in there, and you're saying that even with that contingency, the they contingency? they still they still have to sign off on the release for earnest money. Mm -hmm. They still mm -hmm. they can get out of the contract because of the they contingency. Get out of the contract and go buy they, something else. They're just, holding, they're just holding up their earnest. Money. They're just holding up their earnest money. Yeah, they still have to sign off on it. So, which is why you need to make it really clear in the beginning, like there's there's always a chance to lose money. So take your contracts very seriously. Like you can't just well, get into a contract willy nilly. And it's also a, a reason for me not to put down a lot of this money. Yeah, now it depends on the situation. Like if you're in a multiple offer situation, they really want the house, the earnest money is sometimes something that you can raise just to make your offer look stronger if you're in a multiple offer situation. Yeah. And if I'm confident about the house. Exactly, yeah. If you're confident that it is gonna appraise and it is gonna inspect okay and your financing is good and not gonna fall apart because that's another contingency, um, then yeah, raise your earnest money and look, make your offer look better. But if you're putting $2,500 of earnest money down on something that you're not sure is going to pass an inspection, you're at risk for losing that $2,500. So be real careful. Be real careful. I mean, you want to put, earnest money is not a requirement. Right. You all know that? It's not, and there's some companies like DSLD does not require earnest money on their contracts. Um, so it's just, it's something that makes your offer look a little stronger, but it's it's money that you can lose. So, yeah, it's a real risky business. Um, okay, so all of this stuff you're discussing with them in the buyer consultation, and it's going to spark questions from them no matter what, just because when you start talking about money, especially with buyers in a, in a lower income bracket and they're looking at under 200,000 or something like that, that $500 earnest money is a lot of money to them. It's a big deal. So they're going to ask questions. So always just kind of be willing to slow down and stop and go back and repeat and all that stuff. So patience is the name of the game at this point, especially for first time buyers. Um, and sometimes with a first time buyer, they're going to want maybe a parent to come in with them and, and be there because their parent has bought houses before. Be open to that. Um, I'd be hesitant to go much further in the process with a parent because they can kill a deal in an instant. Um, if it's a house that the buyers really love, but the parent sees one thing that could be fixed on inspection or right. something, it could kill it for the buyer. And then they're, they're devastated because they didn't get the house they wanted because their dad told them the refrigerant line is cracked, which mm -hmm. is common. <laughs> it can be very easily fixed. So um, be willing to uh, have them in the buyer consultation, but just kind of set the expectation that when we go look at houses, it's just going to be us because it can get really complicated and messy. If they insist on it, they insist on it. But there's only so much you can do. But, uh, questions from Shanna, Brittany, or Paula? Y'all good? 
None so far, this is great. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a little bit of what else I have in this folder. So we've got the buyer pre-closing responsibilities. This is some, I don't even remember where I pulled this, like a Ignite thing or something from an Ignite class. This I got from Bold, um, and I can't share it because it's a bold thing. My team gets access to it, but because it's a bold thing, you can't share it with people that haven't taken bold. But it's called The Promise, and it's basically, I'll promise to be loyal to you if you promise to be loyal to me. Um, I'll deliver on all of this stuff. I'll make sure you, you know, everything goes as smooth as possible. If when we're finished, you promise to send me a referral, that kind of thing. So it's, it's both sides understanding that, um, you're, you have a loyalty to each other without actually signing that buyer agency agreement that Jay was talking about. So we have that in there. Uh, we have testimonials. So if you have some testimonials, you can include, if you're on a team, ask the team for the team testimonials and include those. Um, but just a few pages of, here's what our previous clients have said. Sometimes people like to read those, you know, on the toilet or whatever. <laughs> Um, this is something else that JD talked about yesterday. Are you ready, willing, and able? Are you an actual buyer? So having things like this on paper for them to read is like you not just continuing to talk at them and throw information at them. Like they're reading it like, oh, okay, this is a real thing. It's on a document, you know, and it's just a piece of paper you print it off with red ink. Um, but it basically says if you're financially able to complete the transaction now, if you're willing to take action now, and if you're ready and motivated to make decisions now, then you're a legitimate buyer that I can work with. Um, if you're if you're ready because your lease is running out in your apartment, but you're not financially ready, like you can't get pre-qualified, you're not really ready, willing, and able buyer, right? So going over that with them and just kind of letting them realize um, you know, the severity of it, especially the way our market is right now where things selling so fast, you got to be ready to jump. If you're out there looking with a buyer that doesn't have a pre-qualification letter in hand, the houses you're looking at are going to be sold before they can get that pre-qualification letter. Even if their lender calls them back in two days, it's like, yeah, they're good to go. Those houses could be sold. There's, things are selling way too fast to mess around with that. Um, this little blip about Keller Mortgage, and this tells them that they don't charge any lender fees and that kind of thing. So we've got that in there. Eight things you should not do when you when buying a home is in your future. Don't open new credit card accounts. Don't go buy a car, that kind of thing. So they're still going to do this stuff because they're either not going to read this, they're not going to listen to you, or they don't believe you. So the, the entire time, I'm reminding them, like, okay, remember, you've got this nice big living room you need to fill with furniture. Do not go buy furniture on a credit card. Don't go buy a refrigerator or washer and dryer on a credit card. Like, keep your cash in your account and wait till the closing. The day of closing, you can go buy all you want after closing. <laughs> but don't go change anything. Don't go move money around from account to account. Um, if, if you do, they're going to need access, the underwriters are going to need access to those other bank accounts where that money came from because they're going to have to source the money. People don't think about that stuff. Um, if they're getting gift funds, the person giving them the gift funds has to give them bank statements for two months back because they have to see where those gift funds came from. So if you get 10 grand from your grandfather and your grandfather doesn't want to open up his bank records for the past two months to the underwriter, those gift funds are no good. They can't use them. So giving credit advice, you know, as far as amping their credit score, that's not considered overstepping our agency. Um, I would leave that to the lender unless you actually know what I mean, you're talking know, about. From experience, yeah. this is not, you don't do these things. Help yeah. yourself. Yeah. So it's, when I think credit advice, I think like pay your credit card down to 20% or, you know, put something on it that's no more than $100, then pay it off. Things like that. I would leave to the lender to tell them because sometimes paying off a credit card will actually reduce your credit, especially if it's been six months because then your that credit history goes away. Right. So it depends on where they are at financially and you don't know all their financial stuff. The lender knows much better what their credit score and all that looks like. So I'd leave that kind of thing up to the lender, but telling them don't go spend a bunch of money is kind of that's some sense. yeah that's something you most tell them. 
Or you can say if you if your car breaks down and you have to go buy a new car so that you can go to work so you can buy this house, talk with your lender and just make sure you're not buying a car that's too expensive where now your debt to income ratio knocks you off or something like that. Talk to your lender first. So you, you can definitely give them some words of wisdom, but as far as specifics, I would have them talk to their lender. Does that help? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. This I got from Bold also. Things you should absolutely not do for buyers. And then I have one for sellers too. Like don't quit your job. Don't change your job. Don't talk to the sellers directly. Like it's just a whole list of stuff. Again, they're going to do some of this just because they're not going to read it or they're not going to believe you or they don't care. Um, I mean, don't go window shopping and let somebody else pull your credit, especially during this time of year when you're shopping, you go to Belk and they're like, you'd like to open a Belk card today. If that Belk company, if you say yes and they run it right there at the register, that's a hit on your credit and that could knock you off from getting a loan. The smallest thing could completely throw it off. So just letting them know, don't change anything, like fly under the radar. For these next 45 days, Act like you don't exist. Like, don't go shopping. Don't do anything. Don't talk to anyone. Don't look at anyone. It's a serious stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, the, all of this stuff, I kind of step in here just for their reading pleasure. Some other stuff you can include is the RECAD, the buyer agency agreement or buyer loyalty agreement, whichever one you want to use. Um, a buyer net sheet, an estimated closing statement. And on that, when we're discussing what their price range looks like, I'll go ahead and fill in one of the columns so that they can see what those closing costs might look like. Um, and then I'll leave the other ones blank. And I'll say, if you decide you want to pay $250 instead of $200, just put the $250 in here and use kind of the same formula as I did to find out what your closing costs are for that. Because they'll go home and they'll play around with it and see if they can afford it. Um, so I include one of those. Um, you can also include a purchase agreement so that they can read over that. Um, a list of homes that once you look at them on the MLS together, you can kind of print out like the one liners where it lists them all on one page and then they'll go home and go to Zillow or whatever, and get pictures and that kind of thing on their own. Um, that's pretty much it. And then your business card. These folders have a little space to put your business card in it. So always put your business card in there. We have little promo things like little magnets and calendars and stuff like that that we have for our team that we can put in there as well. Just because they're flat and easy to put in here. But really can stuff it with whatever you want to stuff it with. So. Okay, questions, concerns, comments? Cool. <clears throat> okay, so once you've gone over all that stuff, then comes the fun part when you can pull up the MLS and our conference rooms are all equipped with big TVs that are computers and you can pull it all up there and look at it all together. So you'll pull it up and you'll start to ask them your questions. The main ones, price, which if they haven't talked to a lender, they may not know what price they're looking at. So then you can, if they don't, you can ask them, well, what are you paying in rent right now? Do you want to be higher or lower than that? Are you okay with being higher than that? And just kind of come up with a, a guess on what their price might be before they talk to the lender. If they have talked to a lender, then they know exactly what their price range is. So price, um, size of the home, both square footage and bedrooms and bathrooms. Some people are okay with a 1,200 square foot home as long as it's got four bedrooms. <laughs> so the bedrooms are going to be tiny, but sometimes they don't care. So ask them both. Um, and location, Spanish Fort is very different from Foley. South Fairhope is very different from North Fairhope. Like it's very different. If they need to be in a certain school district because the kids are currently in school and they don't want to move them out of their current school district. If they want to be in a neighborhood with a pool, if they want to be not in a neighborhood because they don't want restrictions or something like that. Those are all kind of like the most important questions that are really going to narrow it down. From there, if you've still got 100 homes on the list and you need to pare it down more, because like JD said, you want to try to get it down to 10, because you don't want to show more than five, you're going to try to get it to 10 initially. 
um, you can start going towards, do you need a fence in backyard? Do you have a dog, you need a fence. Um, do you have about a swimming pool? Or do you need the master to be on the first floor? Um, do you need brick or would you prefer brick over vinyl or something like that? Do you need one story or are you okay with two stories? Do you need a two car garage or is a one car okay? Or is a carport okay? Um, it's really just kind of start narrowing it down from there. Once you've got it down to about 10, then you can look through the pictures. Um, it'll give you a, you, you've all been on the MLS, right? You know what it looks like when they pull up the list and click on the MLS and pull it up individually. So then you scroll through individually, look at the pictures, and then they'll start to see the difference between a $250,000 home and a $180,000 home. They'll, I mean, it's very clear what the difference is when you start looking at pictures. Or a $500,000 home and a $300,000 home. It's very clear. So they will automatically start to eliminate from those 10 in their heads, whether they're saying it or not, they're already checking them off. Like, mm, that one's way better and it's the same price, so the other one's off. And you'll agree with them most of the time. Now, if it's somebody that is just not giving you anything and you can't tell what they're thinking, just ask them. Just continue to ask questions because you're there to help them and represent them and you can't do that if they don't talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, and feel free to tell them that too. I mean, if you need to stop what you're doing and say, hey, it's, it's difficult for me to understand what it is you're looking for. Can you tell me more? Tell them. You need to know more so that you can help them. Just stop what you're doing and ask more questions. Um, and JD was talking about wives versus husbands, right? It can be very different talking to both of them at the same table at the same time. You're getting two very different stories of why they want to move, where they want to move to, what kind of house they want, <laughs> it can be very different. So figuring out who the boss is um, and kind of catering to that while also taking the other person's needs into account because you don't want to dismiss them completely. So it's a very fine line. It can be difficult to navigate, but you can do it. Um, Print out the list of the ones that they say, yeah, okay, let's go look at those and put that in their folder for them. Go ahead and schedule an appointment to meet with them. Now, you always want to leave any conversation with another conversation scheduled. You never want to just say, okay, I'll, you know, we'll talk later or whatever. You want to either say, okay, y'all go home, talk about it tonight, and I will call you tomorrow at five o'clock or six o'clock when you get off work and you're home or whatever. Always have something scheduled, even if it's a scheduled phone call. Okay. You want them to expect to hear from you and then you want to show them that you can follow through and actually do what you say you're going to do. Um, if they're ready to go look at stuff, they're pre-qualified, they've got a list of five and they're ready to go look, get it scheduled so that you can schedule those showings in show time. Um, have your calendar with you at the appointment. I always bring the folder, I bring a notepad, and I bring my calendar so that I can schedule it right then and there. Um, let's see. What else? Alex, you've sat in bar consults with me. Mm -hmm. Any, anything I'm missing that I've done or? You basically have everything on now to that I'm done. Okay. It can take a while. I mean, even scheduling, did you already say scheduling the appointments to go see? Yeah. Uh, properties. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. if they say, well, let's go look Saturday. Okay, great. I'm going to block out my whole day Saturday. Mm -hmm. Are you, would you prefer the morning or the afternoon? We want the afternoon. Okay, cool. I'm going to go and schedule these starting at 1230. I'll let you know where to meet me first. It does. It shouldn't matter to them what order the houses go in. JD said show the best one first and the worst one second. For me, I do it geographically. Like mm -hmm. if we're showing everything from Spanish Fort to South Fairhope, sure. I'm going to start the north and go that way. Um, if you're only looking at two, then yeah, show them the first one, the best one first, whatever. If you're showing five, do it geographically, it's just easier. And, and I do, I call them and I say, okay, I've got a set up. We're going to be showing, we're going to be looking at houses from 1230 to 330. Meet me at 123 Main Street and you can just follow me to the rest of them from there. Then when I get there, they've got their folder, right? I say, bring your folder with you. I give them a copy, a, an MLS client view copy 
of all of the lit, all of the houses we're seeing. And I put them in order. I write a number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. So they know what order we're seeing them in. And they have them with them so they can make notes themselves and keep them in their folder. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll, I, all the time, I'll research the properties at least a little bit. I'll look and see if they've had price reductions, how long they've been on the market, things like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll write some of those notes on their copies. Mm -hmm. If it's something really important, like, hey, the roof was just replaced last week, something like that, I'll highlight it or whatever so that they have some notes on their pages. I mean, not the, those would be in the agent remarks, correct? When you're able to find that type of Or the public remarks. public remarks. Or if they have a seller's disclosure on documents on MLS, sometimes I'll print that out and just, I'll, I'll keep that to myself, but I'll go over it with them when we're there. But yeah, I don't sure. normally. I didn't know they had the documents on there. Mm -hmm. the yeah, so they don't always, sometimes you have to ask for it. Oh, okay. But in the little action icons, if there's a D, that's documents. Okay. So then you know there's something there. Sometimes it's a seller's disclosure, a survey, um, the restrictive covenants, whatever. Um, so I'll pull that up and see what they've got. If it's something worth printing, I'll print it and take it with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I look at the history of the property to see if it's been reduced or maybe they just bought it a year ago and why are they selling already? That would be a good question to ask a listing agent. Just kind of make some notes. That way when you're looking through the house, you're not just looking at the house, you're actually teaching them about the house at the same time. Questions? Shana, Brittany, Paula? No, but thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Has anybody done a buyer consult that had issues with it that you'd like to discuss to try to overcome the challenge or anything like that? Unrealistic price range with features. So like when they say they want this type of house, but you know it's not going to be a $180,000 house, it's going to be a two hundred and fifty dollars or more. Mm -hmm. Kind of being able to explain that to them without coming off as like salesy or. Um, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. So you just have to show them. You just have to pull up the houses with them right there. Mm -hmm. Like, look, this is the criteria I'm entering. I'm not putting anything extra. I'm putting $180,000 maximum with a pool. Mm -hmm. There's no results. Like you're showing them there's nothing available. Mm -hmm. But if we go up to 220, now there's two results. So you're going to have to go up to get what you want if that's really what you need for the house. Mm -hmm. And just show them like right there in the consultation. I usually eliminate it. And you can tell them too, like, look, I'll set you up for a search with that. That way, if something does come up, it'll email it to you automatically and we can go look at it. But right now you're seeing what I'm seeing. There's nothing available. So yeah. Anything else? How much time do you spend on each of the five listings? Um, each of the showings? Yeah. Well, just, you know, preparing for each showing of the um, five, top five, maybe. Not long. Once you do it a few times, you kind of get into a rhythm. Like, I'll pull them all up so I can just kind of scroll through each one, one by one. Um, I hit the H icon for the history, and then I write on there, um, you know, I'll write on the paper, started at 250. We're right now, the list price is 230. So we know they've come down 20,000 or they've had five price reductions, or it's been under contract two times or something like that. And all that's in the history. Mm -hmm. If there's no history, then maybe it's an original owner. They never sold it before, or they haven't reduced it because it's only been on the market two weeks or something like that. But you've got it all right there. And then I go to tax records. I make sure it's not in a flood zone. Um, I make sure if there's restrictive covenants, I make sure it's not anything weird. Like if it's a Lake Forest house, I know to tell them you're going to be paying a $400 transfer fee. So be prepared for that. And that's something you need to add to your estimated closing costs is a $400 transfer fee. Yeah. There are other ones too that have transfer fees. And you'll, you'll know them along the way, but you can always call the HOA company and ask them, do you have a transfer fee and how much is it? Because that'll be on your buyer to pay. Um, and you just kind of go through and you read the remarks and you highlight or underline or whatever important things. And then you move on to the next house and do the same thing. You look at documents, if there's any documents, if it's something worth printing, like a survey or something, you do that. 
If it's several acres and they don't have a survey, I'll go into the GIS maps and print out a plat. I'll find a copy and print out a plat because a lot of times when it's multiple acres, they want to know from standing at the house, where are my boundaries? Is it the tree line? Is it the fence line? Is it, you know, past the tree line or whatever? So they want to see that. So if there's not a survey and there's more than an acre, I'll print out a GIS map. Or if it's like a weird shape or close to the water, then you can print out the map and show the proximity to the river or whatever. They're not, not super long, maybe three to four minutes on each house. And Sometimes it opens a rabbit hole. <laughs> I have to go a little further. Like maybe you just don't want to get trapped in one, you know. Yeah. You get hung up on one, and you're like, oh. Yeah, and sometimes you do. Like maybe you're looking at tax records, and it says the estate of somebody as the owner, and so now you're like, okay, is that person still alive, or is their family handling it? Have they already gone through the courts to have permission to sell the property? Do you need to have letters of testament theory? So sometimes it opens up a hole that you have to kind of follow to really get the details. Class. <laughs> but you get you get um good at it the more you do. I mean, I would say until you are doing this live, go randomly pick five properties and just research them and practice research them. See if you can find out. Cool. Is this helpful? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Everything now is you know starting out is helpful. Yeah, you're soaking it all in. Yeah. Yeah. I look like a sponge anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we all look like a sponge this year. Um, okay. Well, grab some folders from Melissa, whatever you need them. We grab them by the tens just because we go through so many of them, but you can always just get one from her if you want. They'll just put it on your bill. Or you can go buy some red folders from Walmart or Home Depot or, I mean, Office Depot. And just put a sticker on it or something. And it, just, it looks professional and like you prepared something just for them, even though we just pull them off the shelf. They're already made. I know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely leave them with something. Something to take home and read, and then you can reference back to it later. Okay, we're showing properties. I'm going to bring your folder I gave you on day one. Yes. <coughs> Okay, thank y'all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Bye. Let me know if you have any questions about it later. Thank y'all online. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a good day. Welcome.